So to end our evolutionary biology microevolution lecture series, I wanted to talk to you guys about selection. I want to focus a little bit more about one of the most important types of actual mechanisms that drive microevolution. Now, of course, you have mutations, and they're going to be the source of the variation upon which selection works on. You do have gene flow, which brings in new genes or takes away genes from the population. You do have genetic drift, which causes random effects, causing sudden changes in the population. And, of course, you have non-random mating. But ultimately, it is selection that is the major driving force of evolution. Now, I already did a video on the evolutionary lecture series about selection and how it works. And so I'm not going to go over everything from scratch. So I'm just going to review what we actually finished up talking about it in this video. But before I talk about that, let's talk about the concept of fitness. Now, of course, fitness has to do with your ability to survive. And the idea is that you're going to have adaptations, which are things that make you more likely to survive, either physical or behavioral features of, of the species, which increases the species' chance of surviving. Now, the idea of Darwinian fitness has to do with the best set of adaptations, or in other words, how much any given individual is contributing to the gene pool because that is the look that's most beneficial. So if you want to say how fit you are in terms of Darwinian fitness, you have to look at how common the genes that you have are in a population. And that has to do with how much pressure the environment is putting on those genes. And then there's also the concept of relative fitness, which is comparing the fitness of different members of the same species and trying to understand how much does each is likely to contribute to the next generation. So it goes along with the idea of Darwinian fitness. Darwinian fitness has to do with how much is contributing to the current gene pool. And then relative fitness has to do with how much it will contribute to the next generation of the gene pool. And they kind of go along, they go together. And remember that fitness has to do not just with having the best set of adaptations, but also of having the situation that will actually increase your chances of having a longer lifespan, reproducing faster or more, and then also have success in the offspring. In other words, the offspring lives to do exactly the same. And that's what fitness is all about. And those who are the fittest tend to survive through the process of natural selection. Now, remember, natural selection has something to do with artificial selection. It's kind of like the same thing. Artificial selection is just the natural selection that humans do. And we talked when we did this, the evolutionary theory lecture series about how us humans have worked on selection in a lot of different things to create all the different breeds of dogs that we see, all the different types of plants that we actually see. For example, you look how one plant gave rise to all those types of, of types of lattice and greens, you know. You have the cabbage, the kale, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the kohlrabi, and the Brussels sprouts all actually made from of differential selection for specific parts of the tree. If you select for larger terminal birds, you make cabbage. You select for lateral birds, you make Brussels sprouts instead. You select for longer stems, you make kohlrabi. You select for the leaves, you make big leaves, you make kale. You select for stems and the flowers, you make broccoli. And you select for flowers, lots of flowers, you make cauliflower. But basically, all of these, these eventually came from the same ancestral plant that's not even around anymore, but or at least not as often, but we actually created new kinds or new strands of that plant through, uh, through progressive selection. The same thing is true about the look that you see in dogs and cats and things like that. And the concept of natural selection, of course, is very similar. It's about the same thing, except it's the environment that's putting pressure. More animals are always born than they will, will survive because populations tend to grow exponentially. But the thing is that environments have limited resources, so not all members of the population get to live. And so... That means that they, since they are different they, and they will have to struggle to survive, um, the differences among them will make the difference. And then the ones which have the best set of adaptations will live longer, have more children that survive to do the same, and therefore they will contribute more to the next generation and become more common in the gene pool. And that's basically how selection works. And over time, that's what leads to differentiation of species across populations, especially if you also lead to isolation. And we'll talk more about that when we do speciation on the next video lecture series. Now, there are a lot of things that put what we call selective pressure. Animals compete for a lot of things, you know. First, they compete for their niche um, or their roles in the environment. Think, for example, about, say, these two uh, uh, animals that live in a river. You have the hippopotamus and you have the, the alligator or the crocodile. And then they're trying to fight for the same kind of niche, the same role, the same position, the same habitat in the environment. 
They're so, although they are completely different animals, they prefer different things, you know, of course, hippopotamus will control their internal temperatures, crocodiles will not, they are reptiles, they're completely different clouds of the sea of uh, the tree, tree of life, but they have features which are the same. Both of them live in the water, both of them want to, you know, have fighting for that land. They both like to stay in the water for extended periods of time. They both like to eat sometimes the same type of thing. Therefore, there's going to be some degree of overlap between the two of them. And therefore, they're going to be fighting. And whichever one is the strongest will occupy that niche. So that's the idea of the actual niche versus the realized niche. You know, think about the lion and the hyena. The hyena can do, could do a lot more than it does in the savanna. It could hunt more, it could eat more. But the lion is so powerful that it takes over some of the niches that the hyena could occupy. So the potential here of the hyena is limited because of, of the niche of the lion. So the hyena's realized niche is slightly different. So see how they, they uh, fight for that, for that niche, for their role in the environment. And there, no two animals can occupy exactly the same niche. There's also sexual pressure, uh, pressure to actually reproduce, pressure to look good, pressure to look better, pressure to uh, look more, you know, vir virile to, or to have a better chance of carrying the offspring. All of these things will lead to what we call sexual selection, and we'll talk more about that on, a, on, the on another video soon. There's also, of course, habitat change. That's going to be a major pressure on the world. As the world goes to things like uh, pollution, uh, global warming, and deforestation, and other things that humans are doing to the world, a massive amount of pressure is being put on animals, uh, what we call density independent factors, to actually destroy a lot of the life on Earth. That's a the habitat change is a big deal because animals have what we call tolerance levels. They can't expand beyond a certain niche and so they won't be able to live if the environment changes too fast. And that's why catastrophism is all about, you know, they can't survive. Animals, of course, and organisms compete for resources and they compete for nutrients, they compete for mates, they compete for shelter, they compete for all kinds of different things. And that's true even in humans, that's why we have wars. There's, of course, also competition between predators and prey. The competition to survive and not be hunted, or the competition to be the better hunter and actually catch the prey. That's ultimate pressure that's going to lead. It's very, actually very interesting. You know, you, you see the way that the cheetahs run and how fast they run and how they have the coloration pattern to kind of like uh, mask themselves in the savannah and to not be seen. But at the same time, you have these antelopes which have very good hearing. They, 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 they position themselves in ways that there's always uh, some members of the herd looking at one way at all times. They also have techniques to the way they run away. They zigzag and they jump around. They try to do, do, do things that the cheetahs can't keep up with. They, they're herd in large groups. You know, they try to be as fast as they can. You know, and meanwhile, the cheetahs will try to hunt together to try to um, corner the animals to so make sure they pick the weakest ones. So constantly, new adaptations make the predators stronger. And then constantly, the prey has to respond and, and also come up with adaptations of their own to try to, you know, ad adapt to uh, survive the adaptations that the predator puts. And throughout time, this will cause what we call co-evolution or the evolution of both of them kind of together, you know. And that's an example of these things that we're talking about. Now, and just so you can't say that I didn't give you an actual example of selection in this video, look, for example, at the way that the guppy coloration will evolve in different environments. Notice that depending in the kinds of pool that the guppies live, either upstream pools or downstream pools, either large pools or small pools, and on the predators which are around the guppies, it will change the coloration of the guppies. For example, killifish will be in both pools, and so that's going to put a certain kind of pressure. But on the bottom downstream pool, you're going to have killifish and in the pipe cyclid fish. And so the guppies that live in that pool will look completely different from the guppies that live in the other pool. They will look more, a little more bland and a little less sophisticated in coloration because they actually have to blend with the environment a little bit more since they're exposed to bigger predators and more predators. So they have to be a little bit better at blending. And you see how that selective pressure leads to different looks between the guppies. So here you see that with no or very little predation, you're going to have a lot of correlation. But with high predation, they're going to look a little more bland so they can kind of like mix with the rocks and be less visible by the predators. So that's, of course, why there's so much variety of life. Why animals develop things like camouflage. Why animals develop things like better hunting skills, higher intelligence, greater speed, herding behavior, hibernation. Every single thing, every physical characteristic, every 
behavioral adaptation. Everything that the animals do and everything the animals have and everything that they are can be explained by the kinds of pressure that they were under or that their, uh, their forefathers or progenitors had been under. And that's why life is the way it is. And I hope that you get all of this. And you know, in the next video, we're going to talk about some of the things that actually lead to um, variations in that, that the speed at which selection actually takes hold of the population. I'll see you guys then.